So the pilot edition has been a huge success. We have discussed some great topics such as licensing and regulation within gaming, within the UAE, the difference between Rack and Dubai, and what gaming has to offer coming in, in the future. Uh, we've discussed pros and cons in Dubai, and watch, watch more for what's coming on our next podcast. Thanks for your time. Hello and welcome to the first episode of Bet Talks. My name is Rick Gods and I am here with a very close personal friend. He is a licensed attorney that specializes in crypto and blockchain. Welcome, Mr. Gordon Einstein. Rick, I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you very much. And I'm very excited to be here for the first I'm very excited, I should say, to be here for the first edition of Bet Talks. I feel like I'm getting on the ground floor of something amazing. And this is a fantastic concept you've all come up with. Absolutely. This is the first edition of Bet Talks, and we're very excited um, to start this. We are going to be discussing topics based on the gaming sector and regulations within the UAE, um, which is a very great topic uh, to be discussing. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of talk, a lot of talk. There is a lot of talk. I think that the, we'll get into it, but the, the key is to understand how much of that talk is real, how things are looking to develop, and especially how the audience can interact with and benefit from what's going on, even though there's uncertainty. So I think this, you're, this is a very timely episode that we're doing. For sure. I mean, I've been in the gaming sector for nearly eight years now, uh, working all over the world mm -hmm. with many different operators in several different geos throughout the world, South America, throughout Asia. Everyone is talking about what is happening, what is the gaming regulation throughout the UAE, and what is actually going to be happening in the coming future. Should we dive in? Let's do it. All right, so I, I think that the audience may be aware that the UAE, which of course stands for United Arab Emirates, uh, it's, I'll give a teeny bit of background and then I'll dive in. It's a very interesting country. It's a little bit like Switzerland. The, the individual emirates are very strong and autonomous, but you do have one government in charge of the whole place. And that one government last year, finally, after much hubbub, announced the creation of a regulator to regulate the area of gaming and gambling which opens up all kinds of discussions and speculation. Now, the regulations have not come out yet. As far as I'm aware, the official licensing hasn't come out yet, but the fact that they created this regulator is very evocative of what they did, especially in Dubai, with crypto, with VARA. And once this, this is a huge step, and now that they've taken this step, it's only a matter of time. But how much time and exactly the details, we're gonna to have to get into that. Of course, I mean, this is a huge, huge market. So, I mean, the gaming industry alone, online sector turned over official legitimately 175 billion in revenue last year that is what the online that was online that was what was declared so let's mm. double that let's say the industry is a 400 billion a year in revenue the now i, I gotta ask since you're saying online are you separating out physical casinos physical because what has actually been announced and what is actually under development, the, the win is coming to Rashal Kamer mm. and he's going to be opening in 2027. Now, this is, this is, inshallah, this mashallah. is big, big, inshallah. <laughs> inshallah. inshallah. Um, <laughs> this is big, big news. Um, there's also several talks of the Bellagio, the Caesars Palace mm. and the Aria coming to, well, the MGM Grant, sorry, coming to Dubai. But this is all talk. This is all talk speculation. There's nothing confirmed. I mean, the Caesars Palace has just pulled out of Dubai. Isn't that interesting? They just we, pulled we, out we, Blue World. You have a brand that's 100% associated with gambling that was here before them all that probably came in anticipation of being legalized. They yeah. left, and then we get that Rasa Khema announcement. Of course. Let me give you my theory. I'm giving you my theory, theory, which I've been thinking about, and I had this conversation with many people. Now, if you look at the cities throughout the world, major, major cities throughout the world. Let's look at LA. Mm -hmm. LA is the city. You will drive- My hometown, your hometown. we should mention. Yes. Yeah. You will drive from LA, which is the city, to go or fly to Vegas to gamble. Mm -hmm. um, or get married, or both. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And look at Hong Kong and Macau. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong is the city. Macau, you would travel via boat to mm -hmm. go and gamble in Macau. Mm -hmm. Dubai is the city, Ras al Khaimah, is the extension of the UAE where the first official land-based casino is going to be with mm -hmm. all the attractions, all resorts, address of just sort of developments there. Mm -hmm. So there's there's got to be physical reality around this, um, which will also attract several different um, communities throughout the world, bringing more tourists within the UAE. 
So you're kind of making a geography is destiny argument, which is the location of Rasakema or the UAE generally is creating an opportunity for this industry to, to flourish. And there's reasons maybe why, if not the sun is setting, why someone would go beyond Macau and go all the way to Rasakema or go beyond Goa or, you know, go from Europe and, and come here. Yeah. I mean, listen, obviously within time, things evolve cultures evolve and things change like Dubai was very frowned upon against alcohol now it's very open and um well I can I jump in on that point sure. okay so I want to acknowledge the culture and religion in the UAE and sort of set the context for it and then explain why maybe it's okay for gambling to start here so the UAE as I think everyone knows is a Muslim country predominantly um, and its constitution and legal system is based on Sharia. And Sharia, everyone should know, is Islamic law, right? Under Sharia, there's some things which are haram, forbidden, or halal, allowed. And now I'm not Muslim, I'm not a Muslim scholar, but this is all pretty well-known stuff. There's a category of major sins, and two of those major sins are drinking and gambling. Right, so you would think, why is this happening here? Well, it, it's worth noted. It's worth noting that long before it was being considered here, there was casinos in Lebanon and there's casinos in Egypt. Correct. There are two. Yeah. Uh, Lebanon's multi-sectarian, but Egypt is clearly majority majority Muslim. So there there is precedent, and Turkey has casinos also. By the way, I should note um, there is precedent for gambling and casinos in Muslim countries. But you have to you have to look at the overall context like how is why is this happening is it allowed to happen now the uae as part of its geopolitical or economic strategy or political economy strategy however you want to look at it is trying to carve a place for itself in this century and within the uae you have different emirates you have primarily dubai and abu dhabi but the other um five emirates are important also each trying to figure out their own place and so we have a Everyone's very motivated right now because things are changing fast and they feel like there's an opportunity that if they don't grab that opportunity, they're going to lose that opportunity. So to your point, I, I, I think there's geography plus opportunity is now creating this interest. It is such a big market to not be a part of. And mm. obviously things are evolving fast. But my my opinion, just going back to it, I, I strongly believe that there are casinos within the UAE for mm. gaming ready to go once Rash al Khaima gives the green line. And if, like I say, if you look at Caesar's Palace is now pulled out, but the Atlantis, the Atlantis Royale, who's not saying that these have gaming facilities ready to go? The Bulgari residents, the Burj Al Arab, the QE2 down in Deira Islands. Mm -hmm. It's a physical cruise ship with a built-in casino ready to go. So once you get that first land base, how, how do you know that we're not going to start seeing these all popping up? Right. And actually, I think that's the direction going before. I think what allows casinos and gambling to take place in the UAE is this concept of you have the existing uh, mainland, but what you, the UAE is famous for is building out new properties into the sea. The whole, the whole Palm is right. new. The Blue Water Island is new. Um, the World Island is new. And of course, in the case of QE2, which you correctly mentioned, it's not part of the land structure. It's a boat that happens to be moored here. So you're actually off. Islamic territory of Muslim land. I'm not an Islamic scholar, but I would I would imagine that they've examined this issue and had a, maybe done some research or done have a fatwa issued or something to that effect. A fatwa is a basically a legal ruling or decision saying that in this world where you have this these sort of structures, we're going to allow these items almost certainly for non-Muslims or non-Emiratis, sure. but they're going to allow it just like they do allow alcohol here sure. and, and or in the UAE. You know. So another factor is, I mean, obviously your background is crypto and blockchain. Mm -hmm. You work with several different projects. Um, how do you see crypto integrating, linking within the gaming sector? So I, I'm going to broaden my self-definition a little bit to kind of tie it in there. I, the, the, the crux of being a crypto and blockchain attorney is being a regulatory attorney, right? Because it's such a heavily government mediated uh, area of law. It's far beyond contract. You have to deal with government entities and you have to deal with the regulators. So I'm going to answer your question twofold. The, I've always been of the opinion, and I've been in the opinion since 2014 when I got into crypto and blockchain, that a natural logical use case of blockchain and crypto is for gaming and, and for gambling. Okay, now why? The, it's, it's because games of chance 
are highly programmable, right? Blackjack, everyone knows the rules and everyone knows the variations on the rules. So you can easily make it into code. And we see this right now with online casinos. Therefore, you can easily move it onto blockchain. Now, why would you bother with blockchain? Why, why do you care if you can have a regular casino, if you, you know, or online casino? Well, the, if you're dealing with people at a distance, you don't necessarily know whether you can trust them. To have a blockchain showing what happened with each hand and creating a good record of it increases your safety. It lets the player know that the result that happened actually happened. It lets payments out become automatic and you don't have to trust or wait. So I remember having a conversation back in 2014 in Odessa of all places with an early Ethereum developer mm -hmm. saying that we want to come up with a smart contract version of Blackjack. So it, it lends itself, the underlying structure lends itself very well to it. Also, there's the nature of crypto, uh, the ability to send and receive payments instantly without a someone in the middle lends itself to gaming and gambling and trust and the ability to operate quickly and keep your winnings and live your life with freedom. So I think there's a natural thing there. The other side of it is just as crypto has become increasingly regulated over time and now has to sort of mediate with the regulars, I think gambling has always been very highly regulated. You cannot operate a casino. You cannot operate gaming at any size Same without as the working states. with the regulator. The states is very highly regulated. Um, licensing is, is incredibly difficult. Yes. Um, I work heavily within the conference-based, um, work heavily a lot with Sigma. I think you're being, mod yeah, you're being very modest. You're a global spokesman <laughs> yeah. for several large conferences, including I'm Sigma. I'm sponsored signed by five different brands now, um, mainly within the gaming sector, emerging tech. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of movement throughout the world, but this is still, as I was mentioned before, this is still a very gray topic that nothing is actual physically confirmed. And there's a lot, a lot of talk about it. They, even the, the promotion of gaming and the word yeah. bet is still frowned upon. Uh, it's more than frowned upon. You, you may not do it. Yes, correct. And so the, in preparation for the show, I, I think we both reviewed the laws here. I mean, it, it, is, it is illegal. It is a penal action, it is a crime right now to gamble in the UAE. And it's a super crime to host a game or operate a gaming facility. But th that's not unusual. That's not super scary. The, the, so long as they're making a process for the legal and regulated form of these things, I think that's, that's very promising. And to your point about the greatness, that, that's always true with regulation, but especially true here. There's the usual pattern here. We saw it with crypto, and I think we're seeing it with gaming, is you get an announcement, like the win announcement. Everyone gets excited. Everything, everyone thinks it's going to happen right away. Then there's kind of a quiet time. And you're like, oh, they just talked, it's vaporware. Then all of a sudden you get 20 announcements. We set up a regulator, we're, we're, we're taking license applications, get your license in now. This happened with crypto. And everyone gets excited, they fly in, they go, how do we file a license? They're like, we're not quite sure. We're figuring that out ourselves. People get frustrated, but then you slowly work the regulator and, and I have to give them a real compliment. They, they are serious, they announce it it may not be perfect to begin with, but they keep on iterating and they keep on getting better and they don't give up here. It's, it's mm -hmm. nice. Yeah. Um, you know, I love Malta, but I'm going to complain a little bit about Malta. Malta made a lot of big crypto announcements that didn't really follow through. Yeah, there was that. I mean, Malta is a gaming hub. I lived in Malta for close to five years and mm -hmm. Malta is a gaming hub. All of your big operators are incorporated. Bro, it's, 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 it's amazing you're thin because <laughs> all that fried Maltese food is like a disaster. Yeah. Every time I go there, it's like another Malta kilo. Malta holds a, a big close, uh, close to my heart. It's the yeah. home of Sigma. Um, mm -hmm. It's where the official, the, the big conference within November, over 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. But now Sigma's become a global Where you're brand. the MC, thank you very much. Yes, I do promote all the, uh, the but award ceremonies and the uh, opening ceremonies for them. And we work very heavily with uh, operators, affiliates, suppliers. Sigma now has become a global brand, um, doing five shows through, uh, six shows throughout five different conf continents. So mm -hmm. it's become a global brand. And the movement wants this first official land-based casino in Rash al Khaimah actually happens, then that allows the online to come into play. Right, now let me just cycle back, to, let me just kind of complete the circle of what I was saying. What, what, the, the contrast I was drawing was between, there's a lot of countries that are seeking, a lot of small jurisdictions need to compete somehow, whether it's Gibraltar or Hong Kong or Malta or whatever. And they're all trying to compete in similar areas, whether it's crypto or finance or gambling. And there's, they may make announcements because they don't want to 
be seen as not making an announcement, but not all the jurisdictions have the ability to follow through and actually make it happen. What's very positive about the UAE, and we're seeing this with VARA in, um, in Dubai, but also with ESCA, which is the, the national regulator, is they do seem to have the ability to follow through. So even though gaming here is still undecided, the exact nature of the licensing and the exact nature of the regulations, the, the, the point I was making is they, de they do seem to have the institutional capability to make it happen. So I think if anyone's interested in this industry, they shouldn't sit back and wait to see if the UAE is going to make it happen because the UAE has a history of making it happen, unlike some other places. Correct. Correct. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, what they are doing in the UAE is, is incredible. And the, the influx of co different communities coming in and bringing there and investing within the UAE. Mm -hmm. So to bring that gaming regulation in is just icing on the cake for me. It mm -hmm. hooks different markets. It will hook the the Chinese clientele, the more of the Asian market, and bring, bring them mm. in, I believe. But let's touch base on the Saudi. Let's touch base on Saudi and mm -hmm. obviously the movement out there. Um, how do you think that, how do you think the, this official casino, land-based casino, the win in Ras al Khaimah, how do you think this is gonna affect Saudi? Because obviously there's always this beef between Dubai and Saudi, like who's gonna be moving forward with this? Who's gonna be not moving forward? There's a lot of talk, a lot of talk. Sure. So there, the, and here at Bet Talks, this is what we do. We talk. We talk. That. Okay, so it's great. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of look at this like a military intelligence analyst, if you like. All, all these countries in the Middle East, they're all competing and they're all cooperating. They want to maximize their path. And that involves making deals and also competing. And it's always a blend. It's always a, a balance. And it, it's all taking place... And I'm going to go real macro here. It's all taking place in the context of oil as a revenue generator is becoming less reliable, especially as you go out a few decades. We may lose the ability or they may lose the ability to live on their oil. Um, you're seeing a decline in American power, for better or for worse. You're seeing an increase in Russian and Chinese power. So you're seeing Iran rising, for better or for worse. And you have all these dynamics. So all these countries are saying, how are we going to be successful, not in 2024, but in 2030, 2040, 2050, global warming happens. Like, what, what are they going to do? How are they going to live? And so they're all looking to the future. How do they keep their populations employed, safe, and happy? And it's, traditionally, Dubai was sort of the outlier place. Okay, It was the place where you could go and have a drink. It was a place where if you're not Muslim, you can have some pork. I mean, I, I'm not into it, but if you like it, you can have it. Okay, the, it, it branded itself as the lifestyle destination for the European types, right? You know, Abu Dhabi is very nice, but it's maybe a little bit more slow, a little more family oriented, a little bit more government. I mean, as an American, I would say that Abu Dhabi is Washington DC and Dubai is kind of like Miami plus New York together. In yeah, one. I can it, see it, that. Okay, can see. now we be Vegas too, so who, you know, <laughs> it, it, or Ross Campbell will be Vegas. But something amazing or interesting is happening. It's a very dynamic region. Uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the, I guess he's the crown prince of Saudi. I got to get his title correct. But he is seeing that Saudi has a very young population, that the oil's running out, that they need, that American power is a little bit declining now, and they got to deal with Iran and everything else. So he's grabbed Saudi and said, guys, we need to pivot fast. And this is, a, you know, the, the two holiest shrines of Islam are there, or two of the three, I should say. There's Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. So you have Mecca and you have Medina. So you have a, you know, in a very uh, extreme religious group there, the Wahhabists, but they're, they're basically saying, we understand all this, we're going to keep the faith, but we are going to open up and grow our economy. We're going to bring in science, we're going to bring in technology, we're going to bring in new companies, we're going to set up free zones. So now, what was traditionally the UAE's role, sort of the middle approachable place where you could be comfortable with your family and then go to visit Saudi Arabia to do business, that's shifting. It's now becoming a practical, real thing to do business in Saudi. So now if you're the UAE, what do you do? How do you succeed in 30 years when you have this economy that's 10 times your size to your left? Well, you have to, you have to break new ground. Right. That's what's going on. So I think the question here to ask is, do you see gaming in Saudi in the next few years? To no. Why? Absolutely not. Um, look, I... Man plans, you know, who laughs, but it is, it, I mean, the, the fundamental answer is it's against Islam. Okay. It is, a, it is what's called a very grave sin. All right. Now that does not mean that non-Muslims can't do it. Okay. They're, you know, they're allowing some forms of liquor in Saudi Arabia right now. 
for, for non-Muslims. It, it doesn't mean it's, it's bad for everyone. They just say, for us in our religion, it's not allowed. The UAE has something that Saudi doesn't, which it has an extended coastline on the Arabian or Persian Gulf, however you want to which call it. Which you already spoke about, yeah. Right? And it can build out new land. Okay, and it has Iran, which actually they do a great deal of good work with, or economic work with across there. It's you know it's geographically positioned to take advantage of gaming. Where would Saudi even build the casinos? On the Red Sea next to Israel? I mean, what's it going to do? Right. Yeah. So, you know, near Yemen, that doesn't sound like a nice neighborhood right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> where where, where, they, where 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 would they build? They're not going to build in Riyadh. Yeah. The capital now, and the UAE doesn't have that problem. So UAE is uniquely situated in the Middle East to be able to build casinos, and I think it, I think it matches the brand. You know, it's a good reality. It, it, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. Where would they build a palm? Where would they build a Bulgari resident? Where would they build the Burj Al Arab? It's you know, you know. I'll spare you all, all the politics, but hopefully there's going to be peace in this area pretty soon, like a comprehensive peace. Then I could, I could see maybe Saudi building it some places, but right now it's just not really practical. So listen, there is very exciting times ahead. There's, a, like I say, there's lots of talk, but there's there's got to be some reality around this. The, the, the win are developing in Rashad Cayman. The, the fact the, the UAE would not have created a regulator unless they were serious. Okay, It is not vapor. It, it, they wouldn't have a regulator. And the regulator has a mandate to explore the issue and come up with regulations. That it, it is a hugely brave and forward-looking action for them to have done that, right? in the UAE Dubai, there is already gaming anyway. Gaming on raffles, gaming on ticket sales to win things. That's gaming. Well, it's interesting. We're, we're, we're getting into that interesting uh, semantic issue, gaming and gambling. All right? And it's like a lot of things, The it's some people say it's obvious when you see it, and some people, then of course it depends on the person. So to take one extreme, all right, if you play a pure game of chance, not involving any skill, okay, and you win by p luck, for example, a lottery, that's pretty clear that's gambling. Okay, if you and I play a game of chess and we both put in $10 and the winner wins, that's more like in the middle zone a little bit. But, you know, and then there's things like if you and I are in a camel race and one of us is going to win a prize, but not the audience. You know, that's more like a tournament. So I, I remember studying this in the U.S. It's so funny. I, I'm getting deja vu because in, when I was in law school in the U.S., my um, master's paper, if you like, was on Indian casinos. And here I am in 2024. Yeah, yeah. I think this is before you were born. <laughs> <coughs> Anyways, I wrote that paper back. You're showing then. your age now, guys. I, uh, you know, I think my age is <laughs> obvious for everyone to see, for better or for worse. Um, but back, you know, I graduated. I'll, I'll just give it away. I graduated law school in 95. Right, so in 94, 95, um, I wrote my paper on Indian gaming, Indian casinos. And it was a little bit like this because it's highly regulated in the US, like you pointed out. But there was this parallel legal system on Indian reservations. They were, they're governed by treaty. They're not part of the states, right? And so in an interesting parallel, which I think you alluded to in a very clever way, is th these offshore territories, they're almost like extraterritorial zones. So you can do these neat things. So. It's exciting from a legal perspective. It's very exciting, yeah. And I think we've covered a lot of topics here. Um, a lot of talk topics that that are very gray in areas and nothing is actually- Well, here, I'm, I'm gonna flip the script. What do you think is gonna happen, Rick? You're, you're very inside. I am very involved within the gaming sector throughout the world. I do, like I say, a lot of conference-based work. I meet a lot of operators. Everyone's talking about this. Everyone is talking about this, and this is why I wanted here to bring you on to Bet Talk so we could discuss this topic. Now, my thoughts are: 2027, the first official land-based casino will happen mm -hmm. in Ras Al Khaimah. Once that happens, it will allow online community to start. Allow the online gaming that will allow promotion within the UAE. So, who's not saying once the first land-based that Bet365 is not going to be advertising here? Mm the evolution of gaming will start once that first land-based casino starts. So in, in your mind, there's a clear straight line between online physical casinos and online casinos? Well, online online casinos is completely different to land-based. Right. Land-based is your, your Vegas, Macau. You don't have, on base, uh, you don't have um, online in Macau. You don't have online in Vegas. Mm -hmm. It's all land-based, which is obviously a completely different market. But I, I think I think once you I, the point you're making I think you're making is that once you allow for physical casinos, it's a much shorter intellectual and legal path 
to allowing online gaming. Of course, it's the same licensing. Obviously, they, mm. they have to obviously give the licensing has to come into play. The regulatory body has to come into play to allow gaming physically in the UAE. But there's too much talk for it not to happen. Mm. There's too much talk for it not to happen. But the these talks of the Bellagio coming here, like I say, the MGM Grand, the Aria coming here, I can't see that anytime soon. I mean, the MGM Grand, the Caesars Palace in Las Vegas has over 3,000 rooms. Mm -hmm. So they're going to have to build a pretty big island to accommodate these kind of size resorts. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's, but they've, they've done that. They've built big islands. They've built the They've built big islands, yeah. I mean, listen, yeah. for, for, a, for a market of this size, then, yeah, there's no reason why it can't, can't happen. And, and you and I were discussing before. I mean, suppose you're a European and you want to gamble. Where do you go? Monaco? That place is... Yeah, have you been to the Monaco Casino? That place is tiny. Tiny. Yeah. I mean, it looks so good in James Casino Bond. Casino Monte Carlo. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you know, in Casino Royale, Daniel Craig, you know, it looks it looks so glamorous and great. You walk yeah. in there and you're like, you know, what the heck is this? Yeah, it's tiny. It's tiny. You know, it's uh, very old school, though. It gives that old sort it's of like, it's like, vibe. Uh, you know, and then, you know, again, bless it. You know, I've been to a couple places in Malta. that are teeny. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The, where do you going to go other than... I mean, you're not going to Ukraine right now. <laughs> so where are you going to go other than the middle? Well, they, I mean, the win has technically confirmed for a thousand rooms. Mm -hmm. A thousand rooms on Marjan Island within, in Russia, okay. So it's going to be pretty big. Um, but the likes of, I mean, I've been to the win in Vegas. You've got the win and the encore comparison uh, side by side. So mm -hmm. generally, would they bring it? Would we be building an encore by the side of it as well? That's another. Type. I well, I mean, you, you, I think. Have you been to Macau? I've been to Macau. Yeah. Okay, it, 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 my understanding. I have to admit, I haven't been there, but my understanding is that it puts Las Vegas to shame. It does, but it then you got Atlantic City as well. So there's there's a lot of there's a lot of concerns. I mean, I love Vegas. Vegas is, is America's playground, and mm. it is a very fun place. But then you have got the Asian side of it, Macau, which is like I say, it is bigger yet. Um, but right, but, but it's heavily monitored. Correct. Okay, and it's it's one thing when it you know as as if everyone knows you know Hong Kong and Macau. Hong Kong was under the Portuguese and Macau and sorry, Hong Kong was under the British, British yeah. and Macau was under the Portuguese, and they got both returned at the end of the last century, uh, right. uh, 1997 and ninety nine. Right. So the so it's not what it was, and I think that the people are looking at developments in Hong Kong and they want to hedge their bets and. Dubai doesn't have any of the the vibes, if you like, or the, that you have to kind of worry about that maybe Macau would represent. It's a very free, or I shouldn't say Dubai, UAE in general. Okay, th this is a place where there are rules. This is, uh, you need to watch the rules. But so long as you do that, it's a great life. And It is, but Dubai is the playground of the Middle East. Mm -hmm. Vegas is the playground of, of the States. Macau mm -hmm. is the playground of, of Asia. Mm -hmm. So it makes complete sense that this will happen um, and is happening, in my opinion. I, I mean, think I think it's going to happen. For sure. I, I, I think an interesting question we haven't explored yet would be, suppose Rasa is successful, and I have every belief that they will be. So they get the casinos. Now, come with casinos comes the hotels, the entertainment, the enhanced infrastructure, all that stuff. Is Dubai going to sit back and not want a piece of that pie? But this comes back to the conspiracy that I was saying before about the city. You drive, you'll fly mm -hmm. to Vegas to gamble. Macau is out of Hong Kong. It's, it's a very, very similar concept. Well, I, I guess the question would be, would Dubai, do, would Dubai agree with that? Would they say... Because it's, it's, it's all one though. The UAE is you're expanding the UAE. There's nothing really happening in Rash Al Khaima yet. Mm -hmm. Are they obviously doing this to expand the UAE? Of course, yeah, of course. I mean, they're they're bringing. I, I made this comment before. The, every every emirate is beautiful, and every emirate has power and autonomy. Uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi have a little bit of a duopoly going. Okay, and you can go into we can read the history books. It's a very fascinating country. But I think there's always been a desire to develop the other Emirates, and they're being quite successful. I mean, you can look at Sharjah. They have the University, American University of Sharjah. They have a fantastic airport. They're, they're, they're booming. Yeah. Well, Kavain has its great free zone. Uh, Fujairah has a beautiful resort. It's like, you know, all these other places have value. They're, they're beautiful. I think um, what UAE is trying to do is almost like what Saudi is trying to do. It's trying to diversify, it's trying to diversify its economy. It's trying to expand its economy. 
You're trying to build a truly national economy. And uh, this is probably part of that effort. I just think that gaming is going to produce so much revenue and be so successful here in the UAE. Uh, or that other place. <laughs> <laughs> no, that that it's it, the comment I was making before, which is the Emirates here, they cooperate and they compete. They compete very gently with each other. They're all aligned, but there's a lot of money on the table with gaming. So I, I, I think I'll actually be in several Emirates and maybe that's a good thing. But I, I acknowledge and I admire and I guess applaud Ras Al-Khaimah for taking the first step. Because before, to your point, you hadn't really heard about it so much. It was just a nice place to visit. Now they're being very aggressive and very brave. So it's neat. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been to Marjan Island. Obviously, there's a lot of development there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've seen, well, obviously, there's there's helicopter viewing sightings over Marjan Island of where it's actually going yeah, to be. Yeah, you can buy that real estate. You can buy that real estate. You know. <laughs> Absolutely. But big, big companies, mm -hmm. big companies, big opera, big developers are investing in Marjan Island. Mm -hmm. Would they be doing that if this, did, if this was not going to be happening? I think, so here's the comment I hear from everyone. To buy real estate, as you know, is very expensive and getting more expensive. Very okay. active. Very, very active. There's a question of whether or not it's sustainable at these extreme rates. I mean, you know, we, Dubai's had its up and downs so with real estate. You know, 2008 financial crash it really went down. Now it's kind of back up. Um, the trick or the di challenge, I guess, is that there's so much new building all the time, and they're not lacking for land. You can always expand north, uh, and it's hard to make money here like it was 10 years ago. But the comment I keep on hearing is Ras Khema is like Dubai 20 years ago. If you get in now, you're getting in on the ground floor and everyone has FOMO, you know, and for the international audience, it's fear of missing out. Mm -hmm. Everyone has FOMO. Everyone's wishing they'd come to Dubai back in 2005 instead of like, you know, 2024, 25. Well, you know, Ras Khema is the new Dubai. So are you gonna let that chance slip again? It's like, it's like rediscovering Bitcoin you know, the moment the white paper came out, yeah, came out. Are you, you know, hopefully this time you know better. <laughs> so you're basically telling people to invest in Russia came in this. I, I, well, look, I'm not giving financial advice. I don't think you are either. And I, I don't think we're endorsing. We are gambling. not giving financial we're, we're, advice. We're commenting about gambling. We're not endorsing it. Yeah, we're not promoting but, gaming. But you, you know, you can, it's always a question. You, you know, do you sit back and wait for things to develop and be a little bit conservative or do you take a chance? I think in my personal opinion, the UAE has very stable, very intelligent leadership. They have a grand vision that's decades in place. And they've done something very smart, which is they've set up an ecosystem, an environment for other people to come in and work and play and grow. And they kind of sit back and they set the rules, but the rules aren't too heavy so long as you're doing good things. And that to me is the, the a, a program for success long term. I, you can say what you want about different forms of government, you know, and it, it's always tricky what you can comment about, but the, the benefit of their former government is that you can engage in long-term planning and their long-term planning has been good. Okay. They've rarely misstepped. And when they do make a slight misstep, they adjust and they fix and they kind of get it going again. I mean, they're, 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 famously there was construction issues with the palm. Everyone knows that you can go on YouTube and you can see it, but they fixed it. Yeah. Okay. And now it's beautiful. You know, and there was one all around. They, they fixed it. You know, we just had some rains that wasn't so great, but they're fixing it. You know, they, they kind of learn from their mistakes and they're, they stay on track. So I, I think it's, and it, I have no reason to believe that Russell Khema won't be as successful and everyone's pulling the same direction. They're all very enlightened cool. and they all listen and they all adapt. And, and if I can just add, dealing with the crypto regulator in Dubai with Vara is a similar experience. They're, if they don't know, they say they don't know. And if they're not ready, they say they're not ready, but they're always working on it. Yeah. So, I mean, how can, how can you lose if you're like that? Of course. Very good, um, very good conversation. Quickly before we wrap things up here, Gordon, I just want to ask you one more point. Do you think that gaming will be allowed for locals within the UAE? Probably not. Well, it's going to be a blend. So this is, there's two, like, there's two layers to that. I mean, probably not, and it probably shouldn't be. I, 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 think, I think the key, look, UAE has made a national strategy to have a large expatriate community, to have a large non-Muslim community. Okay, but it is a traditional society. It's a very respectful society. It's a very polite society. I, I really think it's, it's beautiful, right? And I think that part of the social contract here is that you can come to the UAE and live your lifestyle. You can practice your religion so long as they're not proselytizing and trying to convert someone else. And 
but you respect the boundaries. You respect the rules. You're, you're in someone else's house. Correct. If you're in the UAE. And when you go to someone else's house, yes, you can use the bathroom and you can use the soap and you can use the towels and all that other stuff. You're not going to trash the place. And Don't take you, you know, come on, yeah. be respectful. Be your host. And, you know, we're in the UAE, you're not many people retire in the UAE. Right, you kind of do your thing there, and then you, you go at some point. So don't don't cause yourself a problem. Don't push it. Gosh. I mean, why? Because you, you, there's so many legitimate, legal, awesome, wealth creating, fun things you can do. You don't have to. There, there's societies actually beautiful. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't want it to be legalized for locals. Okay. Also, another topic. Let's let's look at the pros and cons of gaming being regulated within the UAE mm -hmm. and not. What's your thoughts on that? All right, so great question. Let's divide it, like you mentioned, into pros and cons. Gambling traditionally has well-known benefits and well-known issues that go along with it. So what are, the, what are the benefits of having casinos? Of course, you get employment. That's natural. Of course, you bring in, especially when you have a jurisdiction like the UAE, UAE you bring in external capital, money that come, flows in here that would not otherwise flow in here. Um, there's a lot of, you also bring in maybe a new class of customer, a new class of tourist, because there's a lot of people, wealthy people in Europe and maybe the Middle East in general, or Central, even Central Asia, who don't need to come to Dubai because something like Dubai is sort of close to them. I mean, why go to Dubai when you can go to Paris? Well, the answer might be gambling, because Paris isn't known for its luxurious, huge casinos, right? So you're getting a new more tourists, more visitors, and also a new kind of tourist that you, that you want. Um, it's just more economic activity. <clears throat> and obviously, when you have a large casino that's successful, you have a lot of businesses around it. You have all the restaurants, you have all the entertainment, you have all, you know, sometimes you get manufacturing and service companies. It's just a general economic place. So that that's all the obvious pro so stuff. Dubai now is obviously focused massively on more tourists. Mm -hmm. It is designed for, for people to come. Uh, the oil, as we know, obviously is... That's in Abu Dhabi. It's in Abu Dhabi. It's, um, so Dubai has to bring more clientele base here. And what is that hook? Well, gaming. Right. Now, again, let's tease out the Ras Khema Dubai distinction. Dubai, of course, always wants tourism, but it has a lot of tourism. If you have Ras Al Khema that builds up, you might have people stay in Dubai and then go down there to game, or you might have a parallel system, or... You know, don't quote me to, the, to them, but Russell Hammond may become a gambling suburb of Dubai. Yeah. There's a lot of different ways they can play out. And I, that's, that's why I'm, I'm wondering in my mind if in 2035, uh, after Russell Hammond gets its infrastructure up and running, if Dubai is then going to follow along and say, well, fine, Russell Hammond took all the hits for doing it first. Now we want some of the action. Now we want some of the action. So we're going to see what happens. Now let's look at the con part. In general, gambling comes both with perceived direct harms and indirect harms. This is just the nature of the beast. Gambling uh, is traditionally viewed in Western and Middle Eastern cultures as being sinful or haram. Whether it's in the in Christian Europe, it's kind of viewed negatively. And if you're in the Muslim world, it's viewed as haram. There's uh, an ethical thing to it. If you're in an Asian culture like China, they don't look at gambling that way. They just look at a, they look at fortune, may fortune smile upon you. And if you're a good fortune person, then fortune happens. And what are your fortunes? What are your um, fortunes? I think it's like video games. It's fine, but really, what are you doing with your life? Yeah. So it, it, <laughs> yeah. It's like, you know, the real world is very exciting, and I don't, I don't need my metaverse. No. I just, I, real world, I'm challenged enough by the real world that I don't need to be challenged in the metaverse. I just need to do my stuff here. Good answer. And my life has enough risk in gambling yeah. with investments. I don't need to go play a game I don't understand. But I, I don't judge. You know, I live and let live. You know, as long as you're not, there's a libertarian, you know, I'm sort of a libertarian. As long as you're not hurting anyone else, I think you should be able to do it. But there's obviously borders on that. Like, I don't want someone to hurt themselves with fentanyl yeah. or a drug or something. So I, there's a, there is a role for regulation. Okay. So, so going back to the cons. Well, so so there's the direct, there's like the moral argument. Well, as, thing, as society has evolved, there's become more like, look, if it's regulated and under control and in this sort of environment, it's more like a game or more like a fun th thing. And it, it's okay. All right. Personally, I, I don't have a problem with it. You know, I, I think it's I, for people who enjoy it. I think it's great. I mean, you know, what's the difference between that and, you know, you know some other activity that you spend money on that doesn't produce a direct benefit, but you're having a good time. Mm -hmm. You know, le leisure is a economic good. Enjoyment is an economic good. And if they're happy, they're happy. All right. There's a lot of issues that traditionally have gone along with gambling. 
So imagine your illegal private poker game in New, in New York. You know, you kind of walk in there like, do we know you? Put down your money. You know, and, and Guido's sitting there. All right. There's if you owe money, are you going to get into loan sharking where someone's going to charge you 20% per week? Are you, is it surrounded by prostitution? Is it, you know, is it, you know, is there some blackmail aspect? There, there's all this stuff that traditionally is associated with gambling, you know, like Al Capone style, whatever. I can start drinking, heaven forbid, <laughs> you know, back in the 1920s in America, you know, because yeah. they kind of go together. So, but a lot of that, in my opinion, is when you make the central activity illegal, you invite a lot of parallel or penumbra illegal activities. When you make the central activity clean, nice, and well regulated, then I, I think a lot of that stuff goes away. Take the loan sharking issue, you know, the, the thing where someone gets in debt and they have to pay a lot of money and then, you know, someone tries to break your arm. That's not going to happen here. Okay, because it's not like you're going to some private poker game and, you know, Tony knows where you live and is going to go collect the money. People are going to fly here to, to game. Yeah. They have the money. They don't need some local whatever. And plus, interest is illegal here if you're operating under Shuya. All right. These are people who just sold their company for $20 billion and want to spend a million dollars at the t craps table. Fine. Let them play. It's, it's great. All right. Um, the... The casinos are gonna have liquor. It's gonna be legal anyways. It's not gonna to lead to illicit drinking. You know, and it's, I, I don't, I'm not really wor worried about that. I'm not really worried about the pros. I think maybe, and you kind of see this in Macau. There's an implicit money laundering issue here, but I would trust the UAE to handle that better than Macau has. And, and here's why: the the UAE, um, and specifically, the two financial free zones, DIFC and ADGM, they position themselves as the financial hub of the Middle East. And as much as Saudi and other places are trying to catch up, they haven't yet. These are two beautiful free zones that have been in place for decades. And their reputation is gold. And the UAE was just removed from the Financial Action Task Force gray list. Okay, this, they actually had a rough situation here where you know, they're trying to make themselves a financial hub and they were on a gray list for money laundering. That's not, that's not so great. Sure. They, they are in no position to risk their reputation, they, their, their vision for themselves going forward for the next several decades is being a place where commerce flows in and out. So they, they're, they're going to be hawks yeah. when it comes to money laundering. So I'm not really worried about that. Plus, you have, to, you have these large casinos and the cameras and blockchain and everything else. Yeah. Your opportunity for that kind of stuff goes away. So I'm not really worried about so the pros. Huge benefits, the cons, huge benefits for this taking place and gaming coming in and also downsides as well, which... Um, Minor. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to... The downsides are potential, not actual, and they can be managed. Just, just to be clear, just to kind of reiterate the point. The, the, in my opinion, if you accept gambling as being morally neutral, which I do, then traditionally the bad things that happen around gambling was a side effect of making it illegal. Okay, and that's the easy side effect to cure. You make it legal. Okay, then all the illegal stuff that happens around it is much less attractive. And this is an environment that's not loose. This is a highly regulated, observed, monitored environment. Correct. So I, I think there's very little opening for all that bad stuff to happen. Now, of course, stuff happens. It happens everywhere. It happens in the UAE, it happens in Somalia, it happens in El Salvador, it happens in France. Like it always happens. But I, I think the UAE does a pretty good job of making, you know, certainly safer than London. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> So as an attorney, Gordon, I'd like to ask your thoughts on there has been um, there has been awareness out there that there are illegal underground casinos, poker tournaments already happening within the UAE, mm -hmm. um, obviously, which results to heavily fines and also possible, Maybe more. possible jail sentence. You as an attorney, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts on that? How do you see obviously that changing with regulation coming into play? So let me make a comment on following the law when you're here, All right? The UAE is not the United States. It's not Europe. It's not Canada. Okay. The, you don't want to get on the wrong side of the law in the UAE because the way it works here is if they arrest you, they'll put you in jail and they'll keep you in jail until the investigator finishes the investigation. And only then can your lawyer step in and maybe get you out. They don't have this bail concept. Okay. Now, bounce that off with the idea that if you're in the UAE, you're here by choice. 99.9% .9 of the time you're here by choice. There's always exceptions, okay? But you chose to come here. So if you come here, just make your own internal understanding that you need to follow the rules. It's not okay to do marijuana, okay? It's not okay to gamble. It's just don't, just don't break the rules. Just don't do it, don't yeah. do it, don't do it. Just don't do it. Okay, I always tell everyone. It's like, and as someone who's not 12 years old, I don't wanna spend 
four or five months of my life in jail wondering where things went wrong. No, this, this okay. Obviously. So y yes, sure that stuff happens. Okay, to be honest, if that was close to me, I would leave the room. Yeah. Okay, you know, it, but the I, again, it's not a judgment thing. You know, it's just like I, I don't want to be directly around it. Now, do I have any moral issue with any of it? No, actually, I, I don't. It's just to be smart here. Okay. Should it be that way? I think they know that, you know, maybe the private gaming stuff isn't so great, but they are changing the law and they're going to open up casinos. Apparently that that's fantastic because it's a normal human tendency to want to get together and do this sort of thing. And in my opinion, my little libertarian point of view, it's much more endorsing the human spirit and freedom to allow people to do this sort of thing and to do it in a regulated harm reducing manner. I mean, we're seeing that here. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of movement with the law in the UAE. It used to be, there's this famous story about 15, 20 years ago, some British couple was making out a bit too aggressively on a beach, right? You know, and it's, it's not in keeping with the local customs at, at all. Okay. And they ended up being in, in jail for quite some time. Now it's I, a lot more open. It's, it's a lot more open. Now, again, respect the place you're at. Correct. You can do a lot of things here. You can have an extremely good time. You can make a lot of money. Okay. You can have a good time. You can make money. You can be safe. It, it's a beautiful situation. Just mm -hmm. respect the rules. Yeah. Okay, so another interesting topic that I'd like to address, and as you as attorney, give me your thoughts. So gambling is soon to be, gaming is soon to be legalized within the UAE. Mm -hmm. But we still can't make WhatsApp and Facebook calls. It drives me crazy. <laughs> it drives me crazy. And you know what's really crazy? When I chat someone, hey, don't call me on WhatsApp because it's not going to work. And then they immediately call me on WhatsApp to complain about it. <laughs> I'm like, bro, I just chatted you. It's not going to work. I, I know. It's, it's a little... It is, it is what it is. I, but just to make things super clear, you, if you get your VPN running, you can, of course, then make your call. A lot of people think VPNs are illegal in the UAE. They're not illegal in the UAE. The rule actually is you can't use a, a VPN to access an illegal service. Well, WhatsApp is not illegal. Okay, so don't, don't get all nervous. Don't get all freaked out. But yes, I, I appreciate the irony. It's kind of unusual. You can go to a bar and have a drink. You can have a casino soon. If you're not Muslim, you can go buy pork. But whatever you do, don't make a phone call. No. So, but whatever. Well, it, it is what it is. I, I made the point before. If you're here, just play by the rules and have a good life. Some great points there. Um, I want to thank you, Gordon, very much My here pleasure. at Bet Talks. Um, thank you for coming on the first episode. Um, I hope to see you again. Um, it has been fantastic. Well, you'll see me again personally, no matter what, because <laughs> yeah, you're definitely. like my best friend here. <laughs> but uh, hopefully uh, see you again on the show. Um, yes. We are going to be promoting, we are going to be moving forward weekly, um, bringing on new guests to, mm. to talk everything gaming, everything crypto blockchain, mainly in the gaming sector of what people's thoughts are within the region of the UAE, mm. promoting throughout the world. And I want to thank you for your time. My pleasure. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, boss. It's been great. Thank you on behalf of myself and Bet Talks. We'll see you next time. Thank you.